In this video, I'm going to talk about some of the shortcomings of logic. And this should actually probably be the shortcomings of formal, formal logic. Because in everyday speech, I think logic oftentimes gets conflated with other things. Uh, say, rationality itself. When somebody says that something is illogical, they're saying that it's irrational or... Sometimes I think it gets conflated maybe with common sense that if you're saying that something's illogical that, you know, it kind of doesn't accord with, you know, sort of everyday common sense stuff. And I think other times, too, it can even get conflated with sort of scientific materialism. So if somebody is, you know, having sort of magical thinking, somebody will say that that's illogical, but what they're not talking about really is sort of formal logic. They're just sort of saying that, you know, that doesn't accord with sort of, you know, down-to-earth, everyday kind of thinking. But in this, uh, we in these past few videos, we've been talking about formal logic. And so uh, I'll be talking a bit about the shortcomings of formal logic here. And so... Uh, this chapter, or this section of chapter three in Steven Pinker's book, uh, is called Deduction versus Induction. Uh, but I've also added in here uh, the concept of abduction, which is sort of another uh, common way of thinking about logic here. And so deduction is what we've been talking about with formal logic. And so deduction is arriving at specific conclusions from specific premises. Uh, so you have, you know, premise one, you have your major premise, you have premise two, your minor premise, and then you have draw a conclusion from that. And so with this, uh, if it's sound, so if, if, the, if you're using a valid syllogism, uh, then the conclusion is guaranteed. Uh, and, you know, if it's sound, then we would say the truth of the conclusion is guaranteed. You know, because, once again, it's that difference between valid and sound. So valid just means that the conclusion is guaranteed to follow from the premises. Uh, but we wouldn't say that it's true, like, in the real world, unless it is also sound. And so induction, which uh, is sort of, you know, I think what most people would, if if they had to, if they had to sort of think about it for more than a second, would probably think that induction is sort of the uh, the version of logic that would be sort of in normal everyday speech, and that's coming up with generalizations from collections of data, and so that is kind of the the guiding principle of empiricism where, you know, you observe something, you know, X many times, and then you sort of say, well, th then it must be this. So the famous uh, example that's often used is the, is swans. So all swans are white. And so in Europe, all swans are white. So you see, you know, a swan and it's white. You see another swan and it's white. You see another swan and it's white. And over time, you see enough swans that are all white uh, that you come to the general conclusion. You come to the generalization that, you know, all swans are white. Uh, but then, you know, the sort of weakness uh, or shortcoming of induction is that this is uh, this is a tentative conclusion. So the truth of the conclusion is tentative. So it can be modified in light of new data. And in fact, this conclusion did have to be modified, uh, at least by Europeans. Uh, so this is obviously sort of a Eurocentric uh, way of looking at it. So Europeans discovered, I believe it's in New Zealand, there are actually black swans. And so this conclusion that all swans are white uh, ended up not being the case. And so, uh, and so the, the generalization, the conclusion had to be modified in light of this new data. And then so uh, there is abduction, which is one that's not talked about as much, but uh, it's an inference to the best explanation uh, 
of you know some given observation and so the truth is probable uh, which I guess you is sort of another sort of you know being tentative but uh, so the difference between abduction and deduction so in deduction we start with the premises so you know a which might be you know two different premises and then we try to infer the conclusion B but in abduction we start with sort of the the conclusion or the known conclusion B and try to come up with some explanation a for why B is the case uh, and so this is what detectives do so you might have heard you know the the detectives say no that's a brilliant deduction but what they're actually doing is a brilliant abduction so the known conclusion you know in this case would be sort of you know there is a somebody has been murdered and so the detectives sort of go looking for information in order to come up with some some situation a that is the most likely case for why there is b uh, the dead body and this is essentially affirming the consequent which as we talked about is a logical fallacy but it's not looking to sort of deduce uh, the truth of a an antecedent by affirming the consequent it's looking to uh, attempt to show that the that an antecedent a is the most likely of the possible sufficient conditions so the different antecedents would be different sufficient conditions uh, so we are looking for the 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 best possible sufficient condition that would have led to B and so it's essentially saying you know if X so if your antecedent and you know I've been using the if it rains then it's wet outside but in this case we see that it's wet outside uh, so we're seeing that it's wet outside and then we are trying to come up with a most likely cause of X and so, you know, that would be sort of like you look out your window and see it's wet outside, but you, you know, it's not actually raining right now. So, you know, you maybe turn on the weather to see if it rained or you look to see if there's like a broken water main or something. And so you're looking for information. So you are looking for information in order to come up with some most likely cause X of why it would be wet outside right now and so that is what abductive reasoning is and like I said uh, Steven Pinker doesn't actually talk about abduction in his book but I thought it would uh, be helpful to sort of put that in here all right, so logic works well for deduction, but it will not always arrive at the truth for empirical issues which require induction or abduction. So the empirical issue, say with the swans, you know, uh, we sort of generalize from seeing so many different swans that, you know, all swans are white. And so that is an empirical issue, uh, which, as I said, is, is a tentative issue. Uh, a tentative explanation or a tentative conclusion rather uh, and so in other words logic works for analytic propositions but not always for synthetic propositions uh, so a proposition once again is a statement of the form s uh, is RP which is the form of a subject then a copula then a predicate where a copula is sort of uh, a connecting word that in a broad sense means to be uh, so it's it brings a subject under a predicate so uh, some examples are different copulae uh, so is and are are the ones that we have been using the most those are kind of the the easiest and most common ones but you know a word like am uh, or appears looks or sounds or uh, get or become can all be used as copulae as well uh, and you know if we went down the rabbit hole we could look at you know differences between essential and accidental copula copulae uh, uh, so we have you know s is human which is sort of in uh, an essential one that one is not going to change at all whereas s is walking is accidental whereas s is walking you know and I guess you could complete it right now you know at time t uh, 
Uh, but S is walking is not something that is essential to S, but uh, I'm not going to go too far down that rabbit hole. All right, so uh, the difference between analytic, uh, so let's look at the difference between analytic and synthetic statements. So a, an analytic statement would be something like all unmarried men are bachelors. And so in an analytic statement, you only need to know the definitions of the words to know that this is a true statement. Uh, and so there are different ways that we can think of analytics. So there's analyticity, uh, where the concept of unmarried men is contained within the concept of bachelor. Uh, then there's also synonymity, where the subject uh, could be replaced with any synonym. So. Uh, so we could replace unmarried men with some synonym of unmarried men, like single adult males, and this statement would remain to be true. Uh, so I put this reference here, so Willard von Orman Quine's Two Dogmas of Empiricism, which is uh, probably one of the most famous papers in philosophy that came out in 1951, which uh, sort of calls into question all this stuff uh, about analyticity and synonymity and stuff. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into that, but I just wanted to point out that there is controversy about, you know, what it means for a statement to be analytic and stuff, but I think in most cases people can have sort of an intuitive understanding of what it means that a statement is analytic. So a synthetic statement, then, is one that requires something more than just knowing the definitions of the words. Uh, and so a synthetic statement might be something like Mount Everest is the tallest mountain in the world. And so in order to determine if this is true, a person actually has to go out and com you know measure Mount Everest and then compare it to other mountains. You know, there isn't anything in the definition of Mount Everest uh, that entails that it's the tallest mountain in the world. Uh, and, of course, there's nothing in the tallest mountain in the world that entails that it is Mount Everest. That was something that actually had to be discovered. Uh, so there needs to be an empirical measurement or verification of some kind. And so a lot of our disagreements, you know, in sort of, you know, I guess political discourse, for instance, uh, has to do with these synthetic uh, statements, you know, so are the premises that we're using actually true? Uh, so in other words, do they actually correspond with reality? And so this is the first of one of, of the shortcomings of formal logic is sort of this deduction versus induction. Uh, the second one that Steven Pinker talks about is what he calls formal versus ecological rationality. And so logic requires someone to sort of empty all external or background knowledge to work within a formal system, uh, which uh, Stephen Pinker says this is great in like a logic class or in a math class where, you know, in a math class, if you're asked, you know, what does 2 plus 2 equal, you wouldn't, you know, it would be improper to say, you know, 2 of what plus 2 of what. Uh, you know, you don't need this background knowledge of adding two of something to two of something. You're just working within the formal system of mag or of, of I almost said magic of math uh, that is just two plus two. So just some abstract two plus some abstract two. And so in formal logic, uh, like I said, we're sort of ejecting, jettisoning all this. Uh, background knowledge. And so for instance, the following is valid. Uh, you know, all things made of plants are healthy. Cigarette tobacco is made of plants, therefore cigarette tobacco is healthy. And so our our background knowledge tells us that this is untrue. Obviously, you know, we now know that to, that cigarette tobacco is unhealthy. But this is a valid a valid syllogism. Uh, so we have to sort of get rid of this sort of background knowledge that we have that, that tells us that we know that cigarette tobacco is unhealthy uh, in, in order to look at this in just the formal sense of, you know, this is a valid syllogism. It's an unsound 
syllogism, but it's a valid syllogism. Uh, or even, you know, all humans are reptiles. Socrates is human, therefore Socrates is a reptile. This uh, is unsound, but it is a valid syllogism. Uh, if the if the premises are true, so if the premise all humans are reptiles is true, uh, and if Socrates is a human, then this conclusion Socrates is a reptile would we are guaranteed that that would follow from the two premises if the premises are true. Uh, but as I uh, have said, this is these are unsound. Uh, so there's the difference between validity and soundness here. Uh, and so Steven Pinker says, in most everyday situations, a person will not only be unable to rid themselves of all this background knowledge, it would be irrational to even do so. And so he points out, you know, in the famous trolley problems where you have, you know, a trolley heading down a track. So you have this track and there's a trolley and it, it's going, uh, it's going straight here and it'll hit, you know, five people over here or you can switch it onto this track so that it'll only hit one person and so the rational thing to do would be to sort of shout at these five people and tell them to you know get out of the way get off the track uh, but in the hypothetical we sort of demand that people uh, forget that they have this option uh, because what we're interested in is whether the person who actually hit the switch to cause the trolley to instead go hit the one person rather than going and hitting the five people. But in a, sort of an everyday situation, the logical thing to do would obviously be to shout at the five people because then you would save all six people rather than having to choose between killing one person or allowing five to die. And so, uh, And so essentially what it's saying is that you know, formal logic has to get rid of all this sort of background knowledge. And so uh, that is not always the rational thing to do. And so formal logic is not always, you know, perfectly rational. And so the third and final thing that Stephen Pinker talks about is uh, ambiguous concepts. And so not everything fits into a nice concept. Not everything satisfies necessary and sufficient conditions. And so uh, a necessary and sufficient condition, as I talked about uh, in the video on material conditionals, if and only if S has properties X, Y, and Z, then will S be a P. So then S is P. So what about if S uh, has X and Y but not Z and only satisfies some of the conditions? So for instance, a platypus lays eggs and has the bill of a duck, but that doesn't make it a bird. You know, so you often hear sort of the, uh, the colloquialism, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it's a duck. Uh, but, you know, uh, we can have some of these ambiguous sort of uh, conditions here. So a platypus laying eggs and having the bill of a duck uh, are things that don't necessarily make it a bird. And so, you know, our concepts of like bird and mammal are somewhat ambiguous because, you know, we have uh, the concept of mammal is that, you know, contains sort of this, this condition that it gives live birth. And so with the platypus, we see that that is not actually satisfied. And so the platypus does not satisfy Z, which might be in mammals, gives live birth. Uh, and so we see that uh, there is this ambiguity here. Uh, or we can have S uh, has X, Y, and Z, so it satisfies all the conditions, but would clearly not be P. And so for instance, it, horses are hooved herbivorous farm animals made of flesh, but in the U.S. they're not considered food. And so we might say S, you know, being uh, hooved herbivorous uh, farm animal and made of flesh are sort of the conditions. So maybe we'd have W, X, Y, and Z here uh, are all these sort of uh, necessary and sufficient conditions in order for it to be P, which would be uh, maybe, you know, a a food animal, but we're saying that a horse satisfies all these things, but it is not a food animal. And so once again, we have this sort of ambiguity here. 
And so Steven Pinker actually gives the example of the concept of games. So what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for an activity to be considered a game? Uh, and so uh, these are all sort of things that Steven Pinker goes through. So physical activity, not with board games. So gaiety, which uh, means sort of induces states of joy. So not in chess competitors, not in solitaire Winning and losing, not in Ring Around the Rosy. Uh, does it require skill? Not in bingo. Does it require chance? Not in crossword puzzles. And so we see that this concept of a game is very ambiguous. But it's one of those things where it's like, I don't know how you would define a game, but I know a game when I see one uh, kind of a thing. I think that was uh, in, a, in a court case uh, about sort of uh, art and pornography where uh, I think one of the uh, the jurors famously said I don't know or I don't know how to define pornography but I know it when I see it kind of a thing uh, and so uh, so down here I put you know indeed trying to categorize things is often a cherished pastime for people uh, so if you just look at like metal heads, so people who like metal music, trying to determine into which genre of metal a certain band fits. And, you know, people have, you know, in the metal community uh, have a lot of sort of disagreements about, you know, is this band, you know, death metal or is this, you know, black and death metal? And, you know, you can go down the rabbit hole of all the different genres and subgenres and sub subgenres and stuff like that you know or you know foodies people who are who like talking about food and things like that you know trying to determine say if a hot dog is a sandwich and so you know this concept of sandwich is ambiguous enough and people disagree about whether a hot dog fits into that concept of a sandwich uh, and I guess sort of a more, I guess, politically relevant one, uh, we can also see this as disagreements uh, in, for instance, you know, the events uh, in, on January 6th of 2021 in Washington, D.C. People have all these different, you know, try to define what that was. You know, some people at one end saying it was a peaceful demonstration. So people have actually... Uh, try to characterize it as a peaceful demonstration or a protest that maybe got a little out of hand or uh, maybe it's a full-on riot or maybe it was an insurrection or maybe it was actually a coup attempt. And so, you know, we see that people are trying to define this event uh, in sort of these this ambiguous way. And so uh, this is where a lot of disagreements can come from is sort of this uh, this issue of ambiguous concepts where we see in formal logic we want things to be very uh, we want things to be very unambiguous so you know uh, so we say you know all s is p uh, we want to say that you know that p our our concept here is very unambiguous that it's you know everybody in the world if you showed them this would agree that s is indeed p that you know our subject is definitely under that uh that predicate under that concept uh, and so uh, the, one of the drawbacks or shortcomings of formal logic is that not everything does fit well within a concept uh you know and so if you try to use as a premise for instance you know that that what happened in Washington D.C. on January 6th of 2021 was, you know, if you're if you're going to say that was a peaceful demonstration, you know, and then try to come to a conclusion that therefore, you know, we shouldn't be looking into this or whatever, you know, then somebody who instead says that actually that was a coup attempt and therefore you know we should be looking deeply into this they will come to the conclusion we should be looking deeply into this and so uh, these ambiguous concepts can sort of uh, muddy the waters about you know uh, what sort of conclusion we can draw you know was what happened on january 6 a coup attempt is 
is uh, P a coup attempt or is P a peaceful demonstration uh, where S the subject would be the events of January 6, 2021 in Washington, D.C. Uh, but anyway, those are the sort of three drawbacks of formal logic that Steven Pinker talks about in his book on rationality. And so uh, these are kind of the, as I said, these shortcomings of using formal logic or trying to, or even trying to define rationality as, you know, being able to, is uh, being able to sort of use formal logic correctly and, you know, in, in all the relevant situations. Uh, but anyway, um, I hope you found this video helpful. Uh, in the next video, I'm going to start talking about probability, which will then lead uh, into, so that's the fourth chapter in Stephen Pinker's book is probability, the fifth being then uh, sort of Bayesian probability in particular. Uh, so those will be the next few upcoming videos on probability and then moving into Bayesian probability. So this will sort of finish uh, the discussion on on logic, on formal logic here. Uh, and so anyway, I hope, I hope you found this video helpful and I will see you in the next one.